Good morning, everybody. Good morning. This is pretty exciting. 25th Cider Days. Um, so the you know the purpose of this discussion today um, is to talk about cider culture in America um, because it's something that after 25 years of Cider Days should be a topic that we're all kind of meditating on. Um, there are only a few kind of true cider cultures around the world. Um, and in the United States, I think that cider, at least cider culture the way it is today, is kind of perceived uh, in, as part of the mainstream culture in various subcultures. So cider as wine, cider as farm to table, cider as um, part of the craft beer movement. Um, and so, what makes the what makes cider part of the cider culture here um, is a question that I always think about. And so, when we um, when I was asked to give a talk at Cider, Con, uh, cider Days this year, um, I thought that instead of talking about yeast or something like that, maybe instead we'd get some people up here who have a lot more experience than I do about cider culture and talk about something um, like that, something that's important like that. So, um, you know, a couple of quick things about where we're at right now um, with cider culture in the United States. So. Roughly one out of every three, um, no, sorry, one to three out of every hundred drinks consumed is cider. So if you're out anywhere in the United States, somewhere like one out of a hundred drinks is cider. Um, and less than half of those hundred people could even tell you what a cider is or what constitutes a cider. Um, but to put some context to that, 25 years ago when Cider Days was founded, there were only 55 commercial cideries in the United States. Um, today, we're approaching 1,000. And so, even though it seems minuscule, um, you know, just 1%, 2%, or 3%, um, there is something happening. There is a movement that's taking hold, and maybe it's taken 25 years to get there, but it's getting there. Um, and the fact that these businesses exist, these producers exist, and there are people out there drinking the cider shows that there's an interest in it. And so now it's the question of, what about the next 25 years? Where do we want to see this in 25? Um, and so for that, uh, we've, we have our esteemed panel here today, um, who I think will bring some really unique perspectives to this idea of cider culture looking ahead uh, for the next 25 years. So um, we have Darlene. Darlene Hayes is, uh, the way I like to think of Darlene is that she's a rationalist among petulant artists. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, she's, a, she's a scholar. Um, she's written books about cider cocktails. Um, but she always brings a very sharp and um, a sharp insight to every kind of cider conversation we've that I've personally ever had with her. Um, and so I think that it'll be fun to see um, what she has to say about this. Um, we have Ryan Burke, uh, who you know is one of the few people who, I, who I've ever met that's not only traveled to every major cider um, region of the world and sub-region of the world, but also has collaborated with producers there and understands the culture on a level that many of us don't even have access to. Um, and that's a really special perspective. Um, you know, to us, he might, in the United States, he might represent the site of the company that he works for, but around the world, he actually represents the United States. And so, it's an important perspective um, that I think we'll bring, that he'll bring to this um, discussion. And then Tom Oliver is, um, you know, doesn't really need an introduction among cider people. 
Um, he's the, you know, the most decorated English cider maker. He also has no shortage of opinions. Um, so I think that it'll be really great to have uh, Tom spew some wisdom today and see where it, see where it gets us. Spew. <laughs> Spew is definitely right. Yeah, right. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, and yeah, and as, as April mentioned, I'm, I'm Soham. I'm from uh, Artifact Cider in Florence. Um, come visit our taproom. Taproom is uh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the first uh, little question that I wanted to have um, was to kind of just warm, warm us up a little bit and for all of us to kind of become friends with these guys. Um, so I wanted to ask how... Um, how you came to came into cider, whether that was through an epiphany moment, whether that was through uh, a, a kind of a love, uh, you know, a passionate moment, whatever it was. How did you kind of get here today? Um, so, Darlene, let's start with you. Well, the easy answer is I built a house in an apple orchard 10 years ago and <laughs> get a lot of apples, and so what are you going to do? It's an old orchard planted in the early part of the 20th century. A lot of the trees are amazing survivors, but big standard trees on seedling rootstock and just a lot of apples. So what do you do? So I, I like to make things and started to make some things and I'm down the street from Ace Cider. So we'd go to there to the pub and have a drink on Friday afternoons because that was kind of convivial and became started interested in this beverage. And as I was traveling other places, I'd take an extra day and I'd go to Normandy. I still remember the first time I went to Normandy after drinking Ace for a year or so and, and taste of Norman cider and thinking, wow, this is really weird. This is very strange. I wonder if there's something wrong with this one, right? But they all tasted like that. Well, I guess this is what Norman cider tastes like. But the real epiphany for me in cider was several years into this exploration, going to Astorius for the first time and seeing how cider can operate just as a part of the everyday life of most people. It's just there and people make it and um, people make it themselves at home and they have equipment and their neighbors come over and um, there's a, a store that, that my that the gal that was showing me around took me to. It's kind of a sort of an agricultural Home Depot, if you will. So it's a big box store with agricultural things. If you're a beekeeper, there's a big beekeeping session, section and it, you know lots of seeds and plants and whatnot. And a huge cider making section for just the home cider maker. And I, I can't think of a single place in the, in the States that has anything like this, or frankly, anywhere else. You know, with presses and grinders and glasses and just everything you can possibly think of. And it's like, poof. This is what cider looks like when it's just what people do. And that was really the defining moment for me. Wow. Uh, Ryan, you want to mm. tell us about your, your story? Yeah. Um, I'm from uh, Williamson, New York, which probably most of you don't know where that is, but that's where Mott's is located. Um, so my hometown is more or less the orchards for Mott's. Um, also a dry town from Prohibition in 2004. Um, and uh, sort of those things uh, in flux create cider. Um, and so, oh, and being a teenager. Um, <laughs> which I'm actually not supposed to say that anymore. Uh, <laughs> but whatever. Um, and so, yeah, we um, I grew up uh, around that and made cider as um, a bad kid. Um, actually with a, a uh, Jake Lagner, who is um, in Bark Cider in Williamson, is now open. We grew up together making cider, and we're both now making cider professionally, which is pretty wild. Um, and so that, of course, was not a Williamson Senior High, was not a um, career opportunity. Um, and so it was just something we did. It wasn't something I really ever thought about as an opportunity. It was a pursuit. Home brewing and, you know, right into college, and that get really nerdy about it, but again, um, until I moved to Chicago, um, went to law school, and I went, and I quickly dropped out to become a cider maker. Um, so in that, um, uh, we become my future boss, business partner, and started a cider company. Um, with their Yours. Uh, um, uh, th that was as, as a 
as cider maker, there's one particular uh, moment that always is people. Um, in uh, the 1980s, uh, someone called Roger French wrote a book called The History and Virtues of Cider with a Y. And he wrote about cider at a time when not only was cider not really um, anything other than Strongbow cider from Boomers, but it was then we were down to the last half dozen small makers in Heritage, and the whole thing was, it, it, you know, a really, um, thing. Certainly, there were books about it. Uh, he not only wrote a, a fascinating book about it, which looks at cider in ways that nobody has looked at cider ever since, uh, but it's worth, it's definitely worth reading. He he made cider. Uh, he had a big old uh, stone mill in his living room, sitting room, whatever you would call it. It dominated the entire room. Um, most people have a big television. He had a great stone mill there. Um, and so uh, uh, below the kitchen, he had dug out by hand a cellar, because what you need when you make cider is somewhere cool to store it. He dug the hole under the kitchen and he managed to sort of chock up the, the, the roof of it and everything. But he'd done no uh, lining of the walls or anything, so the cellar always had like six inches or so of water in it. But in order to find the different ciders, he put electric in there. So what the, the, the whole concept of him retrieving a bottle of cider was brilliant because he went down the steps and you never knew whether you'd see him again. Uh, so there was, a, there was an element of surprise there. He, he made cider uh, in his, uh, from trees in his garden and a small orchard he had. And uh, the cider that he retrieved one night uh, for me uh, came up in a 500, uh, in the UK, a 500 ml beer bottle um, with a crown cap on it. The crown cap was rusting. Uh, the bottle was sort of like murky and a bit uh, uh, But he came up and said, I think this, I think this, because his labeling was pretty, as good as my labeling is really. Uh, he couldn't quite make out what it was. I think this is a Kingston Black. Anyway, he opened it and it, and it did that, that thing I love that when you pull a bung out of a barrel, just that real like life and energy coming out and that lovely little bit of carbon dioxide. Poured it, it was golden. Golden and sparkling, it smelled and tasted divine. Uh, it was just like I hadn't tasted a cider like that ever, ever before in my life. I, I knew what cider was. We made farmhouse cider. This was this was a different league, a different, a whole different thing. The sparkle, uh, texture, the qualities of Kingston Black. Uh, it was a brilliant cider. Um, needless to say, only one in every sort of four or five ciders that emerged from this. A cellar was that good, but this was special, and, and I just I remember saying that day that if I'm going to make cider, this is this is what I want to make, um, and it was that, that one cider, that one moment, that's it. That's what's responsible for me still trying to make great cider. I haven't made one as good as that yet. You're, but, you're down to one in three. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, you know, I think that what's what's cool and interesting about this um, this little sharing that we just did is that, and how does it tie into cider culture in America, is that for most Americans, we we know a world without cider in it. Whereas somebody like Tom comes from a world where cider was a part of it, and there was an already an all, a built inbuilt perception about what it was and where it fit in because there's history. Um, you know, here I didn't know what cider was at all until I was probably 21 or 20 years old. Um, you know, and I think Darlene, you you know, the first time you had it was it was like, oh, this is interesting. Actually, the first was the, the precursor to um, Angry Orchard, the when they were selling hardcore. I found a six-pack of hardcore in some store, and I thought, oh, this is it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, we know a world without it. Yeah. Um, and so, as we start thinking about, um, you know, where we've come in 25 years, where the next 25 is, um, I think that there are some kind of hallmarks to what makes... Um, a cider culture that way in a specific place. And so the three, the three of you have traveled all around the world um, and much more than I have, especially with cider, um, in cider regions. So, you know, what are, 
What do you think are some kind of hallmarks of cider cultures where, where cider has just been a part of, of that everyday life? Um, in those places, is it you know cultures can sep can differentiate themselves through a variety of different ways, um, whether it's as a relationship with food, as a relationship with um, secret language or community, um, is it a relationship with some kind of ritual, uh, you know, a way to drink it, a time or an occasion to drink it. Um, you know, what are some of those kind of, what would you think are some of the hallmarks of cider cultures around the world? Um, Ryan, why don't you start? Okay. Um, I think that, I mean, I, I relate a lot of this back to um, Asturias, mostly, because um, for me, the, the truest culture that I can feel and touch and see and participate in uh, is in Asturias. I, well, the volume leader is the UK, cider culture, maybe they're kind of in a similar place that we are, is trying to define it and build it right now. And um, Gabe's one of those people, you can't miss him, he's got a mustache. Um, Tom is one of those people, and there's a few other people that are really trying to revitalize. Um, but if you, you know, think about, and these guys have came over and seen what we've been doing with like CiderCon and Cider Days, and all, there's nothing like that over there. It's very new for that to happen, for people to gather and organize around cider is very, very new, which is crazy to think about. Um, friend, how, how is it um, in Asturias? Like, what makes yeah. it part of their life? Um, sorry, I just wanted to disparage Tom a little yeah. bit. <laughs> Just my natural. <laughs> I keep my head down. Um, I think in Asturias, I think one of the keys is a gathering place. I think that is so important. Um, there is a time and a place to participate. Um, it is, yeah. I mean, it's the it's the food hall. It doesn't exist without food. Um, so, I, luckily, that's a reality of cider because I love to eat and also drink. Um, and so, when you go to Asturias, I mean, you don't separate those two things. There's not a lot of just cider drinking without food associated with it. So I think that's a key to bringing people together. I think the table is a common space. Everybody needs to eat. Not everybody needs to drink, but most of us like to. Um, and so to gather as a community at the table around food with a drink that is local and consistent is, is, is also key. Um, they have one thing. Now, they, they have the sort of reactive craft thing going on there too, but really they have one thing. Um, you know, think about Cedra and Asturias like you would think about Burgundy or Porto. Um, they're all making the same thing from more or less the same fruit. Some people do it better than others, but it's more or less one thing. So people can really gravitate around that as opposed to the U.S. industry where cider is so many different things. Um, and that's amazing. It's awesome. But it also makes it harder to define and support certain things. We're we having a hard time even coming up with common language, right? And we, everyone's got an opinion, which is awesome. That's amazing. So what does that mean for our culture? It means we probably aren't going to be Asturias. Um, and that, that's amazing, too, because this is opening up of what the hell are we going to be and how do we define it? Yeah, cool. Um, Tom, what do you think? Uh, I think uh, the UK, uh, Ryan says it needs disparaging. He's 100% correct. It's eternally disappointing to me that uh, the cider culture, if there was one, um, it was a pretty robust image of a bucolic, red-faced uh, yokel with straw in his mouth, uh, sipping from a clay pot, you know, either, either after a hard day's work or more likely after not having done a hard day's work. <laughs> You know, it's not, it's not, it's not really great. The the, the one area where there really is uh, some strength in, in the bond is in orchards. Uh, you know, even people who don't realise that orchards have apple trees in them find something about orchards that they connect with. And I think that in, in England is is, a, is is the one tangible cultural attachment that is attached to cider. Mm. The reality with drinking, unfortunately, is that. Uh, when you have uh, a, a single brand, I'm going to say Bulmer's Strongbow, really, that spent a uh, hundred years as a company buying up and closing down any opposition, it means that for most people, cider is that one product. And therefore, we have um, a very one dimensional view of what cider is. Uh, and if I say this, you know, the, the vast majority of people in the UK don't even know that a craft cider industry exists. 
it's 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 um, it's more jazz than jazz, and it really is very very tough. So the, we we have a, a big challenge ahead of us, but it's one that there's more and more people uh, taking up the challenge, and I really do see uh, real progress in the, the advancement of the culture of cider, drinking cider, food on the table in cider. Uh, it's good. Um, of course, the other thing we do have is wassails, um, you know. Um, and that, of course, now is open to, um, you know, it may be not the done thing in some quarters, but it's a fantastic occasion and a great event. Uh, and it's another cultural thing that we have maintained. Um, but, you know, 15 years ago, uh, our local wassail, maybe three dozen people turned up. Now we get 300 or 900 people coming. It's, it's becoming more popular, so is it becoming part of popular culture? So I, I, I have a different background and perspective than both of the gentlemen to my either side here. I am not a commercial cider maker, and although I do travel and talk to as many cider makers as I can and visit various cultures, I've gotten more interested in sort of historical perspectives on why cider sort of fits uh, why it, why was cider the thing in Normandy? Why was it the thing in Astorias? Why, uh, why, why not other things? And I think that does have an impact on the history of the culture. Um, I, it's not necessarily something that's going to define it going forward, but I, it's, it seems pretty clear to me that cider was the thing when you couldn't grow grapes and you couldn't make wine. Wine has always had a symbolic and ideological cachet to it for a variety of reasons, so I'm still trying to figure out what some of those are. Wine was the thing. That's what you had if you were, you know, the, the big lord and you had the money to pay for it. And cider was something, because people like to drink things, if you could grow apples, you could, you know, juice them and ferment them. It's not as easy to, to juice them as it is with grapes, because they're hard and you can't stomp on them without hurting your feet. Um, and so cider, I think cider cultures remained very regional. It, they, cider didn't really enter into international trade to speak of throughout the ages. It just, it just didn't. It stayed where it was. And so it was a really small, you know, local, it was a local, local regional drink. Um, a lot the way I think many of the smaller areas of wine culture in Italy were. Um, because they were too far from navigable rivers and it's too expensive to take things overland. You know, that's why there's so many friggin' you know, native grapes in Italy that are still being turned into wine. It's because everyone had their little region and they just made it for their region. And that's, and that's part of what helped them create a culture around it because it was just theirs and it was for them and it wasn't really planned or thought through, it just was. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, these three different perspectives kind of call into, um, into light a lot of the interesting um, questions that come up when we talk about the American cider scene. Because we have the idea of regional, we have the idea of associating it with place, we have the very, you know, common uh, marketing tactic of associating it with orchards, um, uh, you know, but we also have, um, we also don't really have a food and drink culture that much here, um, the way that they do in Asturias. Sure. I mean, I think that a lot of Americans learn to drink the wrong way, and it, a lot of it starts there. Um, you know, we, we learn how to binge drink at a very young age, and we kind of continue with that until maybe we evolve past it. Um, and when a lot of the younger cider drinkers are, are younger people, maybe they grow out of cider before they can even get to the good ones. Um, and, you know, I think that if we were gonna, you know, now we have like, we have a little bit, we have kind of 20 minutes left. Um, and I wanna, this is where I really wanna get into the meat and potatoes of this thing and start speculating on I, the idea of what does an American cider culture look like. We've, we've, we have a historical perspective of it being kind of niche um, throughout history. Um, it's still niche here. Should it always be niche is a question. Should it always be a small thing or should it be a big thing? Is that what we want? 
I have to jump in and say I, America's too big to have an American cider culture. There, are, I'm gonna, I think there are going to be regional cider cultures going forward, right. and maybe it's going to be Northeast or New York or Northern California. But I don't, I don't see that there's ever going to be just a, an American cider culture any more than there is an American cider. I, I don't see how that's possible. Yeah. So, what do you think those? I mean, say we were going to break it down to a couple different regions, what would be some of the things that might make it regional in those places? I think the, the clearest distinctions are in, obviously, what East Coast v. West Coast, Northeast Coast v. Northwest Coast. Um, I mean, this event would not happen in Oregon, Washington, Northern California, maybe a little bit more likely, but still nothing like this, nothing at this level, nothing that's been going on for 25 years, certainly. Um, there's a different approach and a different drinking culture. Um, uh, you know, and that being said, uh, New York City can't support a cider bar. Um, so. Um, you go out there and there's a lot of cider bars and there's 40 draft handles and people are cranking on cider and they're all between 25 and 21 and 35 um, and they're selling more cider in two states than we are on an entire coast. So who's right? Uh, I, I don't know on that. You know, they have a very distinct drinking culture out there that's like a little bit more craft beer, it's a little more like out and about, drink insider, 40 taps, fruit ciders, all kinds of stuff. Whereas then out here in the sort of East Coast mentality is very different. Um, here we are in this like, you know, very quaint um, Northeast, um, you know, talking in churches and speaking about wild fermentation and um, talking about cider culture and what's the future. I mean, it's just a different, this wouldn't be happening. Um, over there, um, and so I think we know we have. There, these are two different ways to get involved in cider, um, and I, I just feel like ours, uh, our, ours, the sort of northeast uh, cider culture is like more, uh, you know, 750s alongside food and probably at home, um, less out and about. There just isn't like the same gathering spaces where cider is being celebrated. It's more on a menu. Um, it's a little bit more quiet. Um, there's going to be five bottles on a list for $35 and up. Um, less likely to be drinking pints and, I mean, no name a place where there's 40 draft handles of cider on the East Coast. Hey, Ancho maybe is the only place if they have that many handles. Um, but other than that, no one. Whereas in Seattle, I think there's five, you know. Um, mm. And in Portland, there's the same amount. Um, so it's just sort of different. Um, I, yeah, I think we can start there. I think those are big divisions um, yeah. in experience, and I think those are markers for culture. I don't know if that's actually culture, but I think we are experiencing things differently mm -hmm. uh, in those two places. I want to really distinguish, though, when you say East versus West, it really is Pacific Northwest. Yeah, and that's North, driven North, a lot by the craft beer North and West Coast mindset, because there's there are, you know, bazillion breweries and things coming out new all the time, and, and so that's, that's sort of fed in. The cider culture is fed off of that. Although that's not all that's the, all the cider that is in the Pacific Northwest. There are a lot of makers that are, you know, going for more of the craft 750 bottle fine cider sort of thing. And they, you know, they're this big. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, my point was more just yeah, the, ex right. the experience of it. How do we experience it in the market? How yeah. do we touch it? How do we feel it? How do we enjoy it together? I feel like here it's much more personal. Out there, it's much more convivial. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And I and I think that's also true. in like, I mean, strangely, Texas is the cider region now. You know, although they're not growing apples down there, they're buying apples from up here and or wherever. Um, and they have a strong cider. I mean, you can party with cider in Texas, and uh, a lot of people. I was just there two weekends ago, and uh, you know, there's a lot of. You know, Jack Sperry's down there, Ancho's going down there. I mean, the, there's that. There's sort of like, you know, more natural, wild stuff going on. Then you have Austin East Cider, who sells more cider in Texas than Angry Orchard does. Um, so, like, that's everywhere. Um, uh, there's a ton of cider happening. I went and visited like four local cider makers, all bringing fruit in from either your coast or mine. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a whole that's happening. If you see five and six and seven and ten ciders in places. People are excited about it. They're fired up about it. And they're not just drinking, you know, Austin East Cider Blood Orange. They're drinking um, Shaxbury Arlo. Right. Um, well, I think what's interesting about that is that it's like the other parts, the Pacific Northwest and the Northeast. The Northeast, we have history with apples, and we have New York State, which is one of the larger apple producing 
um, states in the country. It's number two. Yeah, number two. Yeah. And then we've got the Pacific Northwest, which is the bulk of it at, uh, after that. And so they're apple regions. And then there's cider that's integrated as part of it, and it's reflective of the culture of that place a little bit. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, us Northeasterners like to say that we like to be private in public. And when you were saying that, it made me think about that a lot. Yeah. That, you know, you're not really like showing too much, but you kind of do it behind closed doors. Yeah. Um, and it's a, you know, um, it's a very salty Northeasterner kind of way of thinking about it. Um, whereas maybe in the West Coast, it's a little bit more convivial, as you say, but I don't know. Maybe the Pacific Northwest, but you have to understand that most of the West Coast is Northeastern people right. who moved. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> Can I just, yeah. just point that out? Sure. <laughs> to get away from all the right. salty ones. Could be, could be. Um, could be. <laughs> Tom, so what do you think from the outside looking in? Uh, from the outside looking in, I think there's uh, a, a mainstream popular culture. It would be great if cider could make uh, some uh, some inroads. The great thing would be, of course, I think, that if you said the word cider, everyone knew what you were talking about. That would be a massive step forward across the whole country. <laughs> All right. So that if we knew that cider was fermented apple juice and not sweet apple cider, or whatever, then that would be a huge step forward, and that could be that could be the whole country. But what what would excite me uh, as a cider maker and as a cider consumer is the is the regionality opportunities of fruit that grows really well in this particular region and it may not grow well in another one, giving you, leading you down the road of, for those that want like a deeper culture and more, maybe to them a more meaningful one of terroir and it gives you a chance to then shout about the ciders that you make in your area are a USP for your area and that because so much of culture is is born of not just your day-to-day -day living but in the modern world of tourism and people coming and going and so I think there's a huge opportunity in America to, to do this and to, to shout about your region and I think you know in a way uh, like Frank and Pan Cider Days why, why do I love it when people say would you come and like talk to people no one wants to hear me talking Herefordshire all right <laughs> Single full seat. You know, I can do like it'll be tumble. I use tumbleweed. It'll be tumbleweed in the village halls with me. And if I can't get my mum out because she's ninety now, and some nights she doesn't want to get out, I don't have anyone sitting in the audience. So, so I come here because someone's going to listen to me, or you've got a better. You're waiting for a better one. Okay. But that, that, there's, so, so cider culture has got some real, uh, I think, opportunities here, and some real things you can celebrate. You know, you've got history, like we have history, and you know, you've got to you've got to work that history out. You've got to find out, you know, what bits you're going to use, what bits you're not, and what bits you can't. And uh, and I think then, but I am excited by that the potential of the regionality, and then that overall thing of popular mainstream. And if we can all understand what side it is, would be brilliant. That's how I see it. Yeah, I mean, I think there's also a question about accessibility that this makes me think of. Because, you know, when you talk about the difference between 750s or cans or like draft or whatever's out there, I mean, in a, in, at least in my, my uh, experience, nobody's really that interested in 750s, yeah. or fa a fancy fine cider. They're, and if they are, it's a very, very small, very, very, very small amount of people. I mean, it's... But, it it's and important to know that that's true for wine also, right? Correct. That's a thing we all like to say correct. in cider makers, but like most people aren't buying fancy wine. Well, you most go, people buy twelve dollar bottles of wine. Right. When you go to the when you go to the wine section of any standard liquor store, I mean, there's like innumerable amounts of bottles there yeah. with no story. You really yeah. don't know. I mean, yeah. luckily now we have little computers we can look it up while we're standing there in the store in our pockets. But before that, you'd have to it would have to be curated. You'd have to have somebody potentially recommend something to you, or you just take a shot, try something. Sometimes you spend money that, you know, and it turns out that you misspent it um, with wine, and sometimes it happens with cider too. Um, but like, you know, when you talk about Asturias, like how much does a bottle of Cedar go for in Asturias? Oh, 260. The, 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 it's, it's, it's regulated, so 260, and then the DOP stuff can be 280, maybe it's $3 now? Yeah, so three That's euros like three or whatever euros. is like four, $4.50 for a bottle. That's I the mean, most you can spend. Yeah. Um, and, you know, how many fine ciders are there that people are drinking in the UK that... None, I know. <laughs> <laughs> if, they, if they can buy it for £4.50, 
50, I'm, I might as well pay him five quid at the door and say, go get yourself another drink. It's, it's costing me money. Uh, so I think yeah. that, you know, it's like, okay, we have cider culture as it's developing in places. Um, we have, we can hope that maybe one day people will know what cider is. 25 years ago in the US, they weren't even close. It was like fractions of percentages. Now we're at about one to three, one to five percent maybe. Maybe we're lucky that in 25 years we're at five percent. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and then at that point, what does it look like? Once people, let's, let's just like, let's play a little thought experiment. Let's say people, everybody does know what cider is. Mm -hmm. What happens after that? So let's 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 make a prediction for 25 years from now. <laughs> let's dream a little bit, you know. Well, how would you want it to be? Yeah, I, I, well, want it. That's a different question. Yeah, I want it. Want it. It's a want it question. All right, all right. I think it's. I think that for me, the challenge right now, with something we're working on in the Hudson Valley, is what are our defining apples? Let's start there. Um, let's start in the orchard, because without it, we are nothing. Um, so that's the easiest thing to, to, to start at. Culture sort of grows from there, right? Um, we've decided this is our thing, and we want to interact with it. That, to me, that's where, the, that's where culture is. Um, and trying to get people to agree on what that is is almost impossible. I mean, to the point where, like, I'm just going to say it. This is it. And I'm going to put it on TV, and no one can do anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we were really, you know, what are what are the apples of New York State, and how can we support them, rally around them, and tell a quality story? The Newtown Pippin is one of those apples. So can we agree that the Newtown Pippin is this thing, and we can support it, and we will grow it? Uh, it will essentially become our Pinot Noir. Uh, is that possible? And if it is, then we start to elevate cider in a way that's beyond the things. It's associated with right now beer or wine. We go past that and we claim something that is ours, so we can rally around it. We can continue to interact with it. People will try to grow it better than other people. Um, it'll create demand. Uh, it'll identify that Newtown Pippin is being grown elsewhere, but it will be. An, it, you, will, you know, you'll essentially have to say it comes from here. The same things that great that winemakers do to make them to make this sort of idea build. We, I, I think, we need to do to really define because I don't think originality is going to necessarily be the cider bars of Seattle versus the cider bars of New York. There's something there on people are interacting out in public, but I think that defining the regionality based on the one thing that we have that's different than everybody else, um, you know, how do we elevate that insight and has worked in other industries. Yeah, it's like yeah. we just, there's so many varieties and uh, it's hard to like grasp that, but the closer we can get to that, I think that, that's what I would like to see 25 years from now is like swaths of Newtown Pippin growing in New York State, like being, you know, wherever it's growing. I want that. Yeah. I would like to see exactly that, but more varieties. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, too. Also, more varieties. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, in a sense, that I think one of the things that's interesting about the wine world is that, you know, they defined the six noble grapes, and like, that's all anyone wants to plant. And it, but there are a lot of really cool, more regional varieties that do really well in their little pockets, but because the public doesn't, you know, the average public doesn't, they know what a Cabernet Sauvignon is, at least they know that it's red, and it's going to kind of taste sort of like this, but most of them don't and they know any of these other really, really cool fruits that grow well in their in their place. So yeah. one of the things I think is cool about cider is that it hasn't be quite become that restricted. The regionality is, is absolutely key to all of this and understanding what a region is good at and the fruit that is so special there. But more right. No, limits are not. They're used. They can be yeah. useful, but I think. But I just think. Yeah, I mean, yeah. those interesting varieties and blends and all that stuff is amazing, and all these yeah. special things we can do. But I also think some like you have to remember this for other people, yeah. right? Myself too. I'm also uh, I'm creating hospitality, and I have to create interest, and I want people to be excited about it. So that means I have to the responsibility then is to say it. To 
get them excited about it and or create culture and bring people to the table. And, I mean, so um, to, to simplifying things around is a really good way to get people to understand what you are talking about. Because as Tom, I think, said a couple times, and I could rattle off a bunch of statistics about this, but generally people have no idea what cider is and that it even comes from apples. And of course, we all live, we're, everyone in this room is in a bubble right now. Um, you know, it might seem even from my a big cider company reality is like most people don't know who we are we all know but we do you know studies constantly taking uh, you know consumer research and the reality nobody knows who we are cider is such a very small 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 thing compared to the rest of the drinks market um, and so you know there's a responsibility essentially to paint things in a way that you can look at it yes and say, okay I get it yeah and, and I think one of the easiest ways to do that is to 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 come together around a thing, one thing, one simple thing, and then tell that story that shouldn't ever limit opportunities at, yes. at creativity or, uh, or or anything. But you plant as many varieties as you want. But yes. the more you plant, the more confusing it gets for other people. Yeah. Oh, great. That's good. So the, the, the area where I do think everything is really strong, and this is borne out by why everyone's here, is that that grassroots element of uh, apple growing, cider making, but everything else that goes with it, you know, it's not just cider, you know, you can do lots of things with apples. We're talking about cider and with a, maybe a, a more commercial overarching uh, view of how we would like to see cider progress. But it, it, that grassroots uh, aspect of cider, I think, is in, obviously is incredibly strong in this area. I can't speak for other areas of the States because I don't know. Um, but this may be an isolated situation in the Northeast, I don't know. But uh, I, I think well, while that strength is there, it'll always be something that can be uh, uh, built on to keep it alive amongst every, you know, everyone. So I think, it's a, I think that's, that's a real positive, all right? That, that real ultra-regional, you know, village-based, you know, people growing apples and all that. I think that's... Uh, something to be treasured. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, if I was going to add anything to this, and maybe even just maybe wrap this up, um, is that, you know, I um, maybe for all of us that are here, um, it's something to think about the idea that it isn't just always what we're doing in the cellar, or, um, you know, it's sometimes it's about more than that. It's about how we spend our money, how, what, we, what we're paying for, how it fits into our everyday lives, and how these ideas of maybe one day there'll be, people will know what Newtown Pippin is. That would be awesome. You know, that, oh, and that, and that Newtown Pippin is from New York, or from the Northeast. And when I'm in California, I have Gravenstein, Gravenstein or, or whatever it might be. That would be an amazing place to get to in 25 years. Yeah. And for it not to be, so, like, you know, to be a part of the culture in a way that's like, it's assumed, it's occasional, it's not necessarily like the only drink they drink or whatever it is, but it's part of life and people know what it is. It's a simple wish, but we, we're all a part of that. Everybody here is a part of that because it's something that we don't always think about, but everything that we do contributes to. Um, and so, I guess everybody has their own hope for cider culture in the United States, um, but I hope that maybe you guys got some ideas here today um, about where it could be. Um, so, if there's anything else, I think maybe we have three minutes for questions, if anybody has any. Um, feel free to throw an in, too.
Could you, could you just uh, clarify what that last part was? What, what is it starting to do? It's starting out to be a physical activity. It's here. And, you know, it started at the other oh. So he's saying that with beer, it started macro, it became artisanal. With cider, it's artisanal first, and then macro after that. Could, uh, could you comment? We've got two minutes. I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't agree with that. Um, I think that, you know, 30 years ago, Steve Wood. A couple years later, Woodchuck, Macro. Um, 2011, Angry Orchard, Macro. Uh, then everything else after that. Um, so I think it went pretty. You know, big. I mean, in context compared to beer, not. Even, I mean, Macro. I shouldn't say Macro because that's not true. A macro beer versus macro cider, which is me, isn't even a remote, that's not even close. You know, we're talking about hundreds of millions of gallons beyond anything we'll ever do, right? So it's not even, it's, it's not the same conversation. Um, but I would say, you know, I think it came out flashy and, and I think a lot of people got inspired by that, um, you know, super rapid growth. So 2011 is kind of that moment you had uh, some a lot of noise. Um, as it turns out, Virtue Cider, where I was at before, ton of noise. Uh, Angry Orchard came out that same year, ton of noise. Um, it was in every newspaper, magazine, anyone that was talking about drinks. Um, and after that, flowed this just explosion of of, of cider. Um, and I and I think I mean the Northeast and the East Coast, you see a lot more a smaller, uh, you know, Oops, artisanal cider. Um, but in you know, there's big regional producers now everywhere, the West Coast, down in Texas, in, in Michigan, so uh, in Virginia, massive, you know. Um, so I think we're, we're still at both a sort of lesser macro and, uh, and, and artisanal market going at the same time. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Hannah. Three steps ahead of me.